Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Thank you for being patient with me. Over the last couple weeks, I've been out on a journey, as some of you know, down at Soltara Retreat Center. That's also who this episode is brought to you by. Soltara Retreat Center is an ayahuasca retreat center based in Costa Rica, not Peru, which was quite a different experience compared to my other voyages down to the Amazon jungle, but it was equally rewarding. This episode is with Dennis McKenna, who I was actually down there with. He is the one who told me about Soltara and Dan Cleland, the owner. So when Dennis told me about Soltara and his expedition down there um, in July, I didn't know what to expect because I was kind of thrown off guard. Wait, an ayahuasca retreat center in Costa Rica? It was very strange to me. And then I did more research. I linked up with Dan and he was able to get me down there with Dennis. And this is actually where we recorded the episode down at the retreat center. It was really awe-inspiring to be able to drink the medicine, be in the space, be right next to the space, dapping it up with the living legend Dennis McKenna after ceremonies, eating watermelon with him, drooling out of our mouths, being weirdos. I had a lot of gastro problems when I was down there and every fart, it kind of became a running joke. During and after ceremony, if I let one rip, I'd always blame it on Dennis. Dennis! And everyone would just start cracking up. It was really fun. Really turned into a bonding experience. Dennis hit us with so much knowledge. He did four presentations for us while we were down there. I filmed every single one of them. It was very awesome. I cannot wait for you to listen to this episode. Dennis was talking a little smack to me during this episode for not reading his book. Mind you, he just gave it to me the day before we recorded this episode. I have since read The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, and it is an incredible book telling the story about him and his brother, the legend as well, Terrence McKenna, their voyages in the psychedelic universe. Very inspiring. Um, This Friday at Hamlin University in St. Paul, we have a going away party for Dennis. $20 tickets. Make sure you grab those. Come hang with us at Hamlin University. It is this Friday night. Um, I believe the party starts around 6 o'clock, 6.30. Make sure you grab a ticket. You can find it on Eventbrite. I believe it's called the Dennis McKenna Going Away Symposium or something like that. Make sure you grab a ticket. Um, But I cannot thank Soltara Retreat Center enough. If you want any more information, go to their Facebook page. Um, Look for Soltara Retreat Center. You will find it. It's based in Costa Rica. The cool thing about being a Northern Hemisphere gringo in regards to travel to Soltara, it's a 12-hour day for me. Um, First go-around was only seven hours to get down there. Two flights, easy peasy. It's nothing like the 24 to 36-hour voyage to get down to Peru. Big, big difference. And you don't have to deal with mosquitoes the size of hummingbirds. You don't have to deal with banana spiders the size of your head in your shower when you wake up to take a shower. You don't have to deal with tarantulas crawling in and out of your windows um, or on the walkway to the to the ceremony hall, to the maloca. You don't have to worry about tarantulas. Um, There are some iguanas. There are some lizards, but that's fine. That's easy peasy. You don't have to deal with the ginormous creepy crawlies that are found in the Amazon, and you still get Amazonian ayahuasca brewed by an ayahuascaro in Peru. So it's a game changer. The medicine is a beautiful thing. As long as you're working with professionals who can hold the space and give you the brew, I tell you what, man, it's it's a game changer. I strongly suggest it for anyone who is struggling. You might be struggling with depression, anxiety. You might be struggling with chemical dependency, um, or you might just be a coffee head and, and you need to get off the sugar and coffee. It is a game changer. I got to do so much work over the two weeks I was there. I did lots of ceremonies. I did lots of meditation, lots of reading, lots of progressive conversation. It was very, very enlightening, I must say. 
And also, this episode is brought to you by the new Cameo restaurant at the Castle. My wife and I just ate there last night in Old Mylanta. It was incredible. It was definitely a paradigm shifting experience in regards to how we consume cuisine. I am on a very strict diet um, because of ayahuasca and things I've learned, what I'm trying to escape from in regards to dairy, sugar, and gluten. So Zach Ole and his team, they were on the ball. They took care of us. Um, One instance was I wanted to get the ramen bowl, but I couldn't have the noodles. And I still ordered them because I had the option to replace the noodles with just extra vegetables. And before my dish was going to come out, my waitress comes to me and says, yeah, so Zach, um, he just made you rice noodles instead. Huh? I did not see that one coming. So they were definitely on the ball in regards to taking care of their customer. I cannot suggest cameo at the castle enough make sure you go check it out and once you check it out and enjoy their cuisine make sure you leave a review on facebook anything helps you guys i love you so much thank you for being patient with me over these past couple weeks i've got some awesome episodes coming up to you we've got an olympian we've got mr olympia as well dorian yates and i hope you all enjoy the show we'll see you friday i'm gonna be high Old Denny, old Denny. Now, typically, grab your microphone, you big boy. Typically, we, I have like people who aren't psychedelic adventurers on here. Yeah. Put that thing up to your mouth. Yes, yes. You can talk right into the end. Yes. There we go. Yes. Okay. (laughs) So typically I have people who aren't psychedelic adventurers on, and we always end with a psychedelic question where have they ever partaken in a psychedelic journey or whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. Typically the answer is no, but when it is yes, oh boy, some of the stories we get. (laughs) It's rare that I get to have a complete episode where we're going to talk to one of the psychedelic godfathers. Which is you, Dennis? As I my throw my Godfather, I I prefer Elder actually. Elder, okay. Yeah, or maybe Geezer. Geezer, <laughs> you prefer Geezer? <laughs> well, I like the I like the word. <laughs> I I used to think I used to be able to tell people Geezer was Welsh for wise person, but it's not. It's it it's some word that means a bad person. <laughs> Do you remember growing An up? Old bad person. <laughs> When we would call people Gomers, <laughs> a Gomer, Gomer, uh, not so much. You never, I suppose. You're, uh, are you? You're not from I'm, Minnesota. No, I'm not from Minnesota. Where are you from? Colorado. Colorado. Yeah. Do you make ventures back there? Yeah, I visit once a year at least. I have cousins back there. Mm-hmm. Uh, are we recording this? Yes. Now? Oh my God. I can edit it. Better be it careful. Does, uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Yeah, I have uh, some cousins back there. That's really all that's left of my my uh, mother's side of the family in mm-hmm. Paonia, Colorado, this little town which I grew up in, which you can read about in my book, yeah. right? The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. Um, and um, when I lived there, it was just this podunk town that was all about coal mining and fruit ranching, but... And I was, you know, me and a small group of people were the rebels. We were the stoners. There were only about five of us in town. And, uh, you know, we were the troublemakers. And, you know, when I was young, the only thing I wanted from Paonia was to get out. But now it's a nice town. You know, somewhere in the interim, the hippies moved in. They took it over and they turned it into a nice place. You know, they've got organic restaurants. They've got like 17 wineries, they've got a presentation space, you know, they do all this stuff, and and some of the people that never left high school are still there, and I haven't lost touch because they're all stoners now, of course, (laughs) thanks to my influence, they're either stoners (laughs) or dead, (laughs) and, and, you know, so a couple of years ago, they had this woman that organizes events, she had a visionary summit, at Paonia, 
And it was in honor of Terrence, but I was the guest star. I was the star of the whole conference. So they brought me out, and I was able to present in the Paonia Theater, believe it or not. Places, you know, this place where I was practically run out of town on a rail in <laughs> high school. Now they welcome me back, and pretty amazing. <laughs> How did you feel when Hunter S. Thompson was trying to rename Aspen, Colorado? Yeah, w- what are they trying to rename it? Okay, do you know who Hunter S. Thompson is? Oh, yes, yes, of course. When yeah. he was the he was the rebel there. That's right. He wanted to be the mayor. Yes. He was going to put all the expensive dope dealers in jail and free all the rest. Was that it was... the mayor or the sheriff? Yeah, he, he wanted maybe to be it was the sheriff. The sheriff. Yep. He wanted to be the sheriff. That would be more appropriate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. His obsession with guns. Oh, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, that took him down. Yeah. I mean, you know, what a guy. I have a long history with Aspen, too, because Aspen was just close enough to Paonia that kids in the summer from Paonia could go over to Aspen and get work in the restaurants and things okay. like that, which I did for a couple summers. And then the last summer before... I started college, I went over there and worked for the Aspen Music School. I was a groundskeeper. And, but we had other things going on, too, in Aspen, namely a hashish busted, uh, smuggling conspiracy <laughs> involving my brother, who was in India, who was shipping back you know, kilos of hashish in, in these metal boxes. He didn't even make any effort to conceal it. Well, that didn't last very long. We went down... You know, and uh, but I they couldn't pin it on me, you know, because actually I wasn't involved. I was living with all these people, but I wasn't receiving hash or making money from it. You know. So your brother Terrence was also a kingpin. I don't know if he would have called himself that at the time, but yeah, it was it was his little little hobby that left let him gave him enough money to ramble around Asia for. For years, you know, India mostly and Nepal and so on. Uh, that's where he was. And then the bus came down. And so then he couldn't come back to the States because, you know, they fingered him. And actually, they fingered him. I hate to admit this, but it's the truth because they went through my wallet and they found, you know, an address card, uh, uh, some address with him in New Delhi. So they said, this has got to be it, right? And I'm 18, you know, and they're like, kid, you're looking at 20 years. Is this it? (laughs) Yes, yes, it's it. (laughs) (laughs) Which they already knew, right? Because who else could it be? (laughs) Uh, So as a result, he had to go on the lam for like two years. This was 69. So he stayed out of the country mostly in Indonesia, uh, hunting butterflies, actually, which was one of his childhood passions. Indonesia is a great place to hunt butterflies and hang out if Interpol is looking yeah. for you. So he hung out, you know, for a couple of years. And, uh, and, and in that, those days, there was no email. There was, you know, it was very hard to get phone calls and all that. But during that time, we were working out our plans to go to South America and uh, eventually we did. Is this what you want to talk about, or what kind of do? do. You want to no, talk? I kind of do because you you dedicated your book to your parents. Yes, and talking about the trouble that you and your brother were getting into. Yeah, finding your way in. Right. Did you ever give them a brain aneurysm or a freaking heart attack? No, but we came close. Yes. Yeah, we came close a few times. I think the hash bust was when we really pushed it the most. I mean, that, that, was, that was very anxiety-provoking for them, as you can imagine. But, yeah, and then they were just worried that we were, you know, I mean, no, nobody knew anything about drugs at that time, and my mom was just concerned that we were going to fuck ourselves up badly on drugs, mm-hmm. you know, and tried to reassure her that that wasn't going to happen. And then, of course, we went You were just going we to fuck everyone else up. <laughs> right, right. But we went, then we went to South America and, and did the whole 
trip to La Chirera and got about as fucked up on drugs as you could get. <laughs> that story is Fortunately, incredible. Fortunately, she was dead by then. She, she, my mom died in 1970, just before we really got started on all the craziness. You know, God rest her soul. She had uh, bone cancer, and uh, and she departed in October 1970. So she was spared a lot of pain, I think, you know, from our shenanigans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's get you in that mic. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so what were you guys... This story is very interesting. What were you guys exactly looking for when you made your way into the Amazon? Well, all of this is in the book Mm -hmm. and and in videos and so on, so I don't know if you want to go over it now, but we can to some extent. We were interested in DMT. Mm-hmm. That was that was the the thing that seemed of all the psychedelics, like in the in the late sixties, sixty eight, sixty nine, Terrence was in Berkeley. The psychedelic revolution for of that time was in full swing. Everyone was excited about LSD. Occasionally, mescaline would show up. DMT was very rare, but it was there. And Terence was very good at working the matrix, and he got it. And we both agreed that it was an order of magnitude more interesting, weirder, more bizarre, more just more intrinsically fascinating than all these other drugs, which our experience was very limited. You know, LSD, maybe mescaline. We didn't have, there wasn't all that much to choose from, but we we were convinced that DMT was not only the most interesting drug we'd ever stumbled across, it was the most interesting thing we'd ever stumbled across. And in some ways, like, you know, how many years later, I'm still convinced that's pretty much true, <laughs> you know? And, uh, but the frustration we had with DMT was it lasted so short. It was so short, you couldn't really bring much back from it except a sense of astonishment. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what was that, you know? And not a lot of co- noetic content, no insights, no nothing. It's just like being hit by a celestial freight train or something. That's just, Wow, you know, and so we thought that if we could find an orally active form of DMT, it would last longer, and we could spend more time in that space, and we could understand more about what was going on. And and you know, we thought of it as a, another dimension. We were not we were steeped in science fiction, mm-hmm. not so much shamanic spirituality and all that. That was more of a new age thing that came later. But we were like, this is a portal to another dimension. And we are coming at it from that angle, that it really is a place that we could, you know, get to. And uh, at this point, you already knew about the blood brain barrier and you knew that you had to get it to go through your liver instead of your lungs. Well, we knew, yeah, yeah. Basically, mm-hmm. we knew we were very naive about that. But you know, the only way we knew to ingest it was to smoke it, mm-hmm. which was very short. But we thought, if just naively, without knowing it, really anything about pharmacology, we just thought if you can find an orally active form, it will take longer, it will last longer, mm-hmm. which is true. We didn't know anything about ayahuasca at that time, okay. that that was an orally active form of DMT. And, uh, you know, when we went to the Amazon in 71, that really wasn't even understood by ethnobotanists, that, you know, the, the importance of the admixture plants didn't really emerge until about that time, you know. And so, Would, ad, would an admixture, would ayahuasca be considered an admixture to the chacruna? Well, they'd consider chacruna an admixture to the ayahuasca. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. or diploteris okay. in the case of the other species. Because ayahuasca can be taken by itself, and it has interesting effects. But I wouldn't call them a psychedelic, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, uh, but so we, were, we had this theoretical idea, and then we stumbled on this paper called uh, Varola as an orally active hallucinogen. And that was in the title. And it was a paper by Ari Schultes, you know, the famous ethnobotanist. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And in that paper, and Varola is a genus of trees in the nutmeg family, Myris decasi, and the sap of those trees is loaded with tryptamines, DMT and 5-methoxy-DMT. And it's used by different tribes in the Amazon as a snuff. So they extract the snuff, dry it down, mix it with ashes, and they take it as a snuff. And so that gets around the oral activity because it's not taken orally. So it's like smoking DMT, Mm -hmm. short-acting, very strong, But in this paper, Schultes reported on a different preparation that was used by the Witoto uh, people. And they made an orally active preparation from it. They extracted the sap. They concentrated it down. Basically, they just didn't dry it to powder. You know, they made a paste out of it. You ingested this paste, and it was supposedly very strong. So... When we heard about that, we thought, aha, you know, this is what we're looking for. You know, this is the secret. And we we actually thought of it as the secret. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we thought we were on a, you know, a hero's quest, mm-hmm. I guess, to a certain extent. We didn't think of ourselves as heroes, but maybe we should have thought of ourselves as... And we were definitely impassioned about DMT. And... Uh, so we thought, aha, th- this is the secret, and we need to go for this and go investigate it. That's why we ended up going to La Chirera, because La Chirera was the ancestral home of the Witoto. And there was no secret about that. Mm-hmm. That's where we had to go. Turns out La Chirera figures large in other ways in the, in the counterculture. Um, for example, William Burroughs, in his search for... Yahe in the 1950s ended up visiting La Chirera, of all things. And, and, and when we made our trip to La Chirera, we basically followed in his footsteps because, not consciously, we didn't really know even at the time that he'd been there, but there's only so many ways to get to La Chirera, so we had to hit all the same ports and so on that he hit to get there. Anyway, that's a digression. So we we said, okay, this Witoto preparation, which they call Ukuhe, is the secret. This is the orally active form of DMT, and we got to go find this thing because, you know, we're going to penetrate to other dimensions. We're going to do amazing things, you know. So, uh, so we gave up everything we had going. You know, I was in school. I was an undergraduate studying botany and anthropology mostly, and and Terence was, um, he was on the lam. You know, he had been on the lam from from Interpol, so he was living in Victoria, British Columbia. That was as close as he could get to the States without actually going into the Mm -hmm. States. So he was there. A couple of his friends from Berkeley uh, also signed on to this madcap, expedition and we basically stopped whatever we were doing and we went down there to look for this ukuhe well when we got to la chirera which was arduous you know and my book talks about all that there were many challenges getting there but but when we finally got to la chirera we had been warned, essentially, by an anthropologist who, st- who was studying the Witoto, and we, we knew he was there. We knew he, he would be in one of the villages because the folks in Bogota had said, you know, you have to talk. You have to stop and see this guy. And so we more or less expected to run into him, and we did. And, and he turned out to be a whole other trip. I mean, he was chewing so much coca all the time that he was like uh, on the edge of paranoid schizophrenia. And, you know, he was seeing things in the forest and he was talking about how, you know, you must never go out into the jungle without the machete because the snakes, the snakes are everywhere. <coughs> he got a little excited. And, <laughs> and, he, and so when we told him, so when we showed up, at this village called El Encanto, where he was, where he was doing his field work, which was the next village before we took a trail over to La Chirera, which was on a parallel river. So we show up, 
completely unannounced, right? There's no way to let him know we're coming. And this band of crazy people show up. Far more colorful than the Watoto, because we looked like we stepped right out of Haight-Ashbury. You know, hair down to our shoulders, beards down to our stuff, you know, beads, white robes, you know, bells, incense, monkeys, birds. I mean, we were a colorful tribe, right? And uh, some of us more colorful than others. And I'm just like the younger brother kind of tagging along. And I'm, anyway, you have to read the book for to get the full, the full uh, sort of flavor of it. But, but we showed up. And so he was appalled at that because he didn't expect anybody, and especially not these freaks, you know. And then we started talking about Ukuhe, and he completely went ballistic. It's like, where did you find out about that? What do you know about? What are you here for? You can't talk to these people about this. This is their biggest secret. You know, if you, if you mention this word, you know, they'll kill you. I mean, this, this, is, this is major magic. And I don't know why you're here, but you can't just go in there and start asking around for a kuhe. They will not be happy, you know. And we sort of were cavalier. We, yeah, whatever, Doc. You know, we'll be cool. We'll we'll be discreet. You know, so so he basically wanted to get us out of his village as quickly as possible and on our way to La Chirera. So he found some porters, and we went on to La Chirera, and that was a four day overland trek through the jungle. It was a trail that had been. Uh, uh, built by in the rubber trade era mm-hmm. and uh, and was used to transport rubber from La Chirera, which was a major collection point for rubber, to the village across to El Encanto, where it could be put on a barge and sent on down the river. So um, so we went across this trail, which was obviously hadn't been maintained since like 1918, but there was still something of a trail there, and people people used it, you know, rarely. And so we went across this trail when we got to La Chirera, which practically killed us, this trek. Mm-hmm. I mean, neither one of us were, none of us were athletes or in any kind of really good shape, but we, were, we weren't in bad shape. We were just, that wasn't our thing. We were weak academics. We you know? gringos. Yeah, we <laughs> gringos. But but we made it. We got there. And when we got there, what we found was that um, we actually kind of respected what the doc had said, yeah. even though we dismissed him. But we, we said, yeah, we should be discreet. So when we got there, we found Alachura is this little Capuchin mission village. So there's a padre, a few nuns. They have a school. They have a Catholic school that the Watoto kids come to and basically get their minds fucked over by <laughs> Catholic doctrine. Yeah. But that's another conversation. Well, the school wasn't in session, right? So there were plenty of empty houses around the perimeter. And what they done was they had cleared uh, about maybe two to 400 acres around the village, just cut the trees down and brought cattle in there. The white humped back Cebu cattle, which happens to be the preferred substrate for psilocybe cubensis. Which is? The pan-tropical psilocybin mushroom, which grows anywhere in the tropics. And it was the rainy season, so growing out of every cow pie were these big, beautiful clusters of uh, psilocybe cubensis. And we knew what they were. We'd done our homework. We had had no experience with them apart from a a single encounter on the way in at another place we'd stopped. We'd found, like, two mushrooms. You know, they weren't abundant. By the time we got to La Chirera, the rainy season had set in, and they were everywhere. And we were very cavalier about it. We didn't really understand what we were doing. We thought, oh, wow, these mushrooms are here. We can have fun with these while we look for the real secret, this ukuhe, and we'll make be discreet. But in the meantime, we can enjoy this. I mean, we have a kilo of, uh, you know, we had almost a kilo of, of uh, Santa Marta gold, gold Colombian pot, 
and mushrooms everywhere. And not a lot to eat otherwise. I mean, we brought food in, but we thought there'd be more food there than there was. So we started eating mushrooms, and we started uh, more or less uh, incorporating them into our diet. So we were eating mushrooms every day. And some days we were eating a lot of mushrooms. And uh, it quickly became clear, the mushrooms made it clear, that they were the real secret. <laughs> and they were the perfect orally active form of DMT, which, in fact, they are. If you think about it, they really are. High doses of mushrooms are much like DMT, you know, and, and, and there's only one trivial difference between DMT and psilocin, which is the active ingredient. I guess we don't need to go into all that. But That's what blew my socks off, though, was mushrooms pre-ayahuasca, and then after you take a couple journeys, mushroom mushrooms and how they activate your brain post-ayahuasca. Yes. It's very similar. Oh, it's very similar. It's the, the space is very similar. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, so we got into this, and the mushrooms started to, you know, when you're loaded on low levels of mushrooms all the time, you're in a very interesting sort of conversational and perceptual and cognitive space. You know, your mind works quickly. You have great conversations. Everything's funny. Everything's, you know, just has that extra sparkle to it that comes. I think it's a lot like uh, like microdosing now, which is popular, except a level or two above that, mm -hmm. where we've more or less swacked on mushrooms all the time and having these conversations. And if you have experience with more or less high doses of mushrooms, you know they have a way of presenting themselves in this I-thou relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, you feel like you're in the presence of an intelligence that is not you, but it is telling you things. It has things to teach. And whether that's true or not, I don't really think is important in this discussion, but that was our impression. And, and it had a lot to teach. It was presenting itself in that way. And we even called it the teacher. And uh, it, uh, you know, the, the recreational side of our experiences quickly became more uh, serious in a sense in that it was transmitting what appeared to be a download of information about what we could do. One of the phenomena that we noticed again and again, and, and people notice it on DMT too, is a sound. You can hear a sound. On DMT it's sometimes quite manifest. On the mushrooms, at high doses, you could hear this sound inside your head. It was sort of like an electrical buzzing, mm -hmm. popping, frying kind of sound, not particularly musical, but you could try to imitate that. And uh, you could sing to the mushroom, and you could try to imitate this sound that you were hearing. And if you, if you achieve that then you could reach a place where your voice would just lock onto this sound and it would start pouring out of you and almost to the point where you couldn't stop and it was just like pouring out a very powerful, very energetic, like a chant, except there was no words. I'd make the sound now, but I don't want to collapse the space-time continuum. <laughs> it failed then, but who knows? Maybe, maybe this time it would work. So I'll stay away from making the sound. But it wasn't unlike some of the really powerful chants that you get in, like, uh, Tuvan throat singing and this, you know, this sort of where the sound happens mostly on the vibrational level, you know, and you can feel the wall shake and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the mushroom was saying, I didn't know this interview was going to go in this direction, so we can stop you. Is this what you want? Absolutely. Are you sure? Spill oh, the beans, daddy -o. Oh, God. I hate talking about this. <laughs> uh, so the mushroom was saying, okay, here's what's going on. You can use this sound to do a kind of 
psychic surgery on yourself. And it, it downloaded this whole scenario about how, mostly to me, unfortunately, I have to, I have to confess, I was the one that was getting the logos, uh, you know, and and Terrence was kind of following along, and the other people had completely checked out. They were convinced we were both nuts. <laughs> <laughs> But Terrence was following it, and we were we were following the precepts of alchemy. That this is what we're doing. We're actually getting the download for the blueprints to <clears throat> build ourselves into a UFO, or a philosopher's stone, or mm -hmm. a time machine, or all these transcendental objects that you find in mythology. It's an object, but it's also an organism, and it's also, it's made of mind and matter at the same time. And this was the message we've been getting, that you can use this frequency to resonate your DNA in a certain way that will cause these beta carbolines and tryptamines to intercalate into the DNA and set up a standing waveform, we understood this sound to be the electron spin resonance of these molecules as they bound and unbound mm -hmm. into their receptor sites, which we understood to be DNA. Well, all of this, of course, is bunk, mm -hmm. you know. But we didn't know that at the time, and nobody knew that. There were speculations at the time that the receptor might be DNA in the in the membrane. Well, of course, now we know it's not what the receptors are. You know, we've we've cloned them. We know the exact. But this was all wild speculation at the time. But we had this model, and it said, if you do this, you can activate your own DNA in such a way that it will bind through hyperspace, through four four dimensions, with the DNA of the mushroom that you're singing to. Mm -hmm. And it will create a standing waveform of your DNA or this, this hybrid human mushroom DNA that's a superconducting, uh, a superconducting standing waveform that's radiating out information about what is contained in the, in the DNA, which is essentially everything. You know, it's like the Akashic Records. This was kind of the message that that's in there. Well, again, this is not something any molecular biologist would believe, mm -hmm. but the mushroom was, you know, this was the, the gnosis that it was transmitting was a procedure for this experiment. And... You know, it's, I mean, it was doing it very authoritatively. I mean, we, we didn't, we fancied we were scientists, but we weren't scientists, and we didn't, we didn't have the, the scientific, uh, you know, acumen to question this. And it was just laying it down with such, such authority. It was like, don't question this, just do the damn experiment, you know? <laughs> and so, and we did the experiment, and we had, we had a prediction uh, as to what would happen when that happened, when we performed this, which was that this standing waveform would, would form and it would be visible and it would be mind and matter. It would be, you'd be able to see it and be it at the same time. And it would respond to thought. You would control it telepathically. And it would be literally imagination itself bound into a psychophysical matrix. So it would be an artifact. It would be something that you could hold in your hand or something that with a mere thought you could blow up to the size of a flying saucer or the size of a galaxy if you wanted. It would be the ultimate artifact, what Terence has sometimes called the transcendental object at the end of time. Mm -hmm. We were going to make this thing and talk about messianic ego inflation, mm -hmm. yep. but this is the state we were in. We, mm -hmm. we were being given instructions how to carry out this alchemical uh, process, which, which that's how we thought of it, with the stages of, you know, condensation and, uh, and the, you know, I forget the exact terms, but, you know, in making the Philosopher's Stone, there are basically 
four stages, you know, what are those distillation, four? condensation, inflammation, and so on. Okay. And so we were, and we predicted that this would happen, that, that you know, in, in, a, in a flurry of, uh, uh, you know, energy, this object would condense out of the mushroom. And, uh, and the mushroom would, you know, and this would happen at sub-zero temperatures. It would plunge to sub-zero temperatures immediately, and the mushroom would, you know, explode in a flurry of ice crystals, and what you would be left with was this <laughs> glowing, <laughs> lens-shaped object, which was yourself. And, uh, and... Uh, and then we we thought, and and then once this thing was formed, you would be able to replicate it immediately. Anything you touched, you could make a replicate of it. So it would it would spread across the world instantly, mm -hmm. and you know we'd end history and we'd we'd move into some post historical world. Mm -hmm. This is how deluded we were, you know. But the thing is, we had gotten ourselves into a, a state where because of the events leading up to this experiment, in the hours before the experiment, when we were cooking the ahe, we mixed yahe, that, was, that played a part of this. Uh, you know, things on the physical level, on the unstoned level, seemed to get just very weird. It was almost like approaching a singularity. Mm -hmm. And we interpreted that as a proof that up in the future, a few hours, we'd done the experiment and it was had succeeded, and we were getting the shock wave from the future as time became distorted, and we started to spiral into this singularity. Right, so we had proof before we did the experiment that we had succeeded, which meant that it had to succeed. There was just a small problem. It was completely contraven uh, in contravention to the laws of physics. It could not possibly happen. Well, something had to give, right? And what gave was basically our mental state, <laughs> you know. And we had this. We had about a, a two-week episode where, you know, we were both Terence and I were both three sheets to the wind, but in different complementary ways. Mm -hmm. He became hypervigilant. He didn't sleep for two weeks. And he became utterly obsessed with the cycles that had left, led up to this process. Mm -hmm. And he started making notes and maps, map, literally uh, diagrams on the ground as he was you know, lying in, in, as he was, you know, wandering around the pasture in the night, raving, thinking about this stuff. Me, I was off in the cosmos. I, I my mind became co-contiguous with the boundaries of the known universe or maybe the unknown universe, but my mind was speared all over space-time. You were a stationary astronaut. I was, yeah, I was the stationary astronaut, except I had no sense of self. The universe was me. I was, I was the universe. But slowly, over every 24-hour period, I began to, I began to condense. And so after, and so Terence, being obsessed with the cycles, we were totally fixed on the dawn to dusk cycle. And it was like the crow of the cock every morning. Of course, there were cocks, there were roosters, right? And uh, so every morning we knew that dawn was signified by the crow of the cock and there would be a new stage of condensation in my perception of my boundaries. Mm -hmm. So initially I was just at one with the cosmos and the next day I was like, the mega cluster, and the next day I was the local galactic mm -hmm. cluster. I was the galaxy. I was the solar system. Finally, I was the planet, and then it became about, you know, my genetic uh, precursors and the family and mm -hmm. and all that. So, were you going macro to micro? I was going from macro to yep. micro, yep. 
and I was essentially reconstituting myself. I had completely blown all the circuits, Mm -hmm. you know, talk about default mode network. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had smeared that shit all over the cosmos yep. and and I was in the process of recovery so it was you know uh, or of I don't know if you call it recovery I was in the process of recovering myself yep. I didn't think of it as a pathology I thought of it as the success of our experiment in a certain way but but also I didn't want to spend the rest of my days smeared across the cosmos so it was reassuring that I was coming back into myself. And that took about two weeks. And uh, and Terrence about the same time. And in the meantime, you know, our our companions who were, you know, just observing this, they hadn't really participated, and they were like, they were very freaked out. And it was like, you know, we need to get these people out of here and into a hospital as soon as possible, you know. But it wasn't possible, and thank God it wasn't possible. There's no way you can just call nine one one, you know, or call the ambulance yep. or whatever. And I'm so grateful that they couldn't mm-hmm. because, because actually it was very therapeutic. I mean, it 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 could play out to its end, and what we brought out of it was, in Terence's case, the beginnings of the theory about time, mm-hmm. the time wave, the earliest, you know, scratchings and thinking about these cycles that led eventually to the construction of the time wave. Mm -hmm. What I got out of it was, well, myself, essentially. But having gone through this, for me, it was a kind of a initiation, I suppose. I mean, I was only 20 when this happened. Terrence was 24. Right at that age of time of of life when you think you know everything and actually know nothing. You know, so I was grateful to uh, not be taken to a psychiatric ward and actually just be given the chance to put myself back together over this time. And the analogy, of course, is shamanic initiation. And I'm I'm not a shaman. I don't feel like I'm a shaman. But I went through those stages, you know, where that in shamanism, classical shamanism, that's what happens mm-hmm. when you go through it. You're ripped apart, and your body may be spread all over the place, and then you're put back together. And often objects, magical objects, are placed into your body. And then you're a shaman, and you have these powers, and you have these, these, these things implanted. It's very interesting how close it resembles alien, you know, alien encounters, mm-hmm. where they often implant something, right? But that's classical shamanism, where you're ripped apart, and you come back together, and then you're able, you have powers to heal people or whatever. And... And so, you know, that's what happened. And, uh, uh, you know, and our friends were, you know, I mean, and the interesting thing is that our friends were, like, completely baffled by this, mm-hmm. and they were watching it from the outside. Terrence and I were on the same page. Mm-hmm. We totally understood each other and what was going on and this whole alchemical transformation framework that we'd created to conceptualize the thing. And we we told them, look, relax. We know what we're doing. This is this is happening. And you know, just just relax. You can't interfere with the process. You can't get us float out of there, you know, right now. It's not not possible to arrange it that easily. So don't worry, because this is all unfolding exactly the way it was supposed to. And uh, and pretty much that's been the way it is ever since. You know, I've always had this sense that things uh, are unfolding the way they're supposed to. You know, and it's it's weird because Terence and I have lived. He was twenty four. I was twenty. We have lived most of our life in the shadow, if you will, of La Chirera and what happened. And it's a very strange experience to be a, 
semi-well-known person, but mainly known for my psychotic break mm-hmm. or whatever you want to call it, whatever that was, yep. that has color, covered my, colored my life and it's made, it's a big reason people are interested in, in Terrence and me, you know, and not, not just what we, what we talk about. We got into yesterday how these mushrooms and these experiences guided you, and yeah. it kind of got us into the stoned ape theory, because at yeah. that point, it seemed like you guys were basically hunter-gatherers, in a well, sense, and tapping into our genetic yeah, DNA. Yeah, yeah, in a sense. The interesting thing about what the, the uh, you know, the sequelae of all this, as I look back at it, you know... Um, you can look at my, the video I, I presented at uh, Breaking Convention last mm-hmm. year. Um, I called it the experiment at La Chirera, psychotic break, shamanic initiation, or alien encounter, question mark, right? And in this talk, I was going for alien encounter in a certain sense because it had alien encounters, if you've looked at that literature, uh, they have certain themes always. They're mm-hmm. not simply the UFO came down and took me into the saucer and, you know, there are always things going on surrounding it and afterwards, like, and all the elements were there mm-hmm. f- with the experiment. There has to be a siren song. Mm-hmm. You know, there has, has to be something calling you. Okay, we had that. DMT was calling us mm-hmm. and it was saying... Drop everything you're doing and go to the Amazon and find this thing. And so we went there, and that's one of the themes. And then another theme is information is transferred. You know, secrets are given. You're shown a book. You're shown some information. We essentially were given an experimental protocol how to do this experiment, that was there, and 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 you know another aspect of alien encounters is that, uh, you know, you you come away with something, you're given a gift that may not make any sense, but you take it, you know. And uh, in the case of La Chirera, we we were given two gifts. Uh, one was. Terence's discovery of the kernel of this time wave theory, which he then took and refined over years, you know, and into the time wave theory, which I don't know if you're familiar with it at all. Uh, Is that the time wave continuum? Time wave zero. Break it down for us. Yeah, based on the I Ching, you, you don't know about time wave zero? Just no. Google it. It's this crazy idea that he came up with about the structure of time. Okay. And uh, it turns out it, it was bunk. I mean, a lot of it, a lot of what was given to us was bunk. The other thing that we got from La Chirera that was not bunk, that was not even particularly... There was nothing supernatural or super normal about it, but it had the bigger impact. That was the spores of the mushroom. We collected the spores and we brought them back over the next two years. We tried to grow them and succeeded and pretty much impacted society that way. I mean, that wasn't our agenda, but that's what happened. Our agenda was we wanted to grow the mushrooms because we wanted access to the mushrooms. Mm-hmm. We also wanted confirmation from other people or not that what we had experienced was just an anomaly or there really was some pretty weird shit out there. And of course, millions of people have taken mushrooms since then and confirmed that, yes, there are some pretty strange dimensions (laughs) that these things open up. So, So that was an aspect of the alien you know, we brought back something that really had an impact. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then the other aspect of these alien encounters is there's always an element of absurdity, yep. you know, uh, that tells you that it's not what it seems. It, it does, it, you think this is happening, but it's not what it seems. And, and in this case, the absurdity was... I don't know if you've read True Loose Nations mm-hmm. or 
Brotherhood of the Screaming of the Bit. You got to do your homework, ma'am. No, <laughs> I know. Okay, have you read True Hallucinations? No. Okay, well, you have to do that. That's kind of like the precursor to the Brotherhood. They really are complementary. But in True Hallucinations, Terence describes his UFO encounter, which happened during this period that he was not sleeping and wandering around and gazing over the river while I'm back in the in the hut, hopefully in my hammock, not wandering into the forest, which happened a few times, but that's another story. <laughs> but but and he's just wandering around and and uh, and he looks over the river. It's dawn, another important hour, and he looks over the river, and there are these clouds uh, lying over the the bank, low to the forest, you know, and they start to roil and condense. This is typical of UFO mm -hmm. sightings. It'll be a cloud bank that suddenly starts to condense, and it did. It started to condense into this... UFO, essentially, this disc-shaped object that was actually coming toward him. And it was coming toward him really low. And he was, like, fucking terrified, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and he looked up, and he got a very close look at it. And it was making the typical flying saucer sound, you know, re, 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 re. He looked up. And he saw it very closely. And you know what it was? It was the George Adamski fake UFO that had been reported that he had made using a, um, a surgical lamp and a bunch of photographic trips, tricks to photograph this thing as though it was a UFO. It had, you know, knobs on the bottom of it and portals and all that. And everybody agrees this is a totally fake photograph, mm -hmm. right? George Adamski was a noted, you know, nut, yeah. <laughs> basically, and tried to foist this on the UFO world. Mm -hmm. And they, no, this is not. This is a fake. We ain't buying it. Yeah. And... That was what Terrence saw, and I have no way to verify it. He was the only one who saw it. Mm -hmm. I was off in the cosmos. Our friends were asleep in their huts. But I do believe he saw it, mm -hmm. and he, he has talked about it. So that's the element of the absurd. Yep. You know, this happens, and then you see the George Adamski UFO. What in hell is going on here? You know, and it's just a way of uh, whatever it is uh, telling you that, in a way, you know, you're being set up. You're being, this is sort of a joke in some ways, mm -hmm. or there, there is that absurd aspect to it. So, you know, There's a all deep, of those elements were it. there in what happened to us, these characteristics mm -hmm. of alien encounters. Yeah. And then it's interesting... I haven't really talked about this uh, too much, but it's interesting. So Terence came back with the, you know, so so I more or less pulled myself together mm -hmm. after this encounter, after two weeks. I mean, I was more or less back together enough I could function, mm -hmm. I could open a can of tuna fish and this kind of stuff. Yeah. It took some weeks to get totally back to baseline. I went back thinking, <laughs> I want nothing to do with this. <laughs> I want to go back to school. Yeah. I want to study hard science. I want to, and I want to just be a normal nerd in school and not really be obsessed with this anymore. And not that I lost my interest in psychedelics, but I, I took a, two or three years before I even got back into it, mm -hmm. uh, and I was pretty shaken by the thing. At the same time, amazed. But, but Terence went back, and he had a different reaction to it. He was number one. He was totally convinced that we had succeeded, mm -hmm. and that the only mistake that we'd made was in predicting when this stone, this hyperdimensional object that we were going to create, when was that going to condense? It didn't condense at La Chirera. So then the question became, well, when will it condense? 
So then that became all tied up with his theories about time that he was developing from looking at these cycles and so on. And the cycles were based on the I Ching, and he constructed this this elaborate time wave based on essentially a 384-day lunar calendar based on the I Ching. You'll have to read up with on this. There's not time to explain this. Well, I got through the introduction last night, Okay. And um, I did not know that Terrence was the one who proposed the idea of December 21st, 2012. Well, he wasn't the only one. Yeah. Uh, a lot of Mayanists, the Mayan calendar ended one of the big cycles of the Mayan calendar. Mm-hmm. I think the 16th Baktun or whatever ended on December 21st, 2012. Mm-hmm. He had postulated since 1971 different potential end points. Mm-hmm for the time wave, because the time wave was supposedly, you had to peg it, the the idea was that time does, in fact, end, and you have to peg the end to the right moment in order f- to make it fit the preceding historical and cosmic and geological events that preceded it, right? You had to find the right time. He made several predictions about what the end point would be, those those dates came and went, and nothing happened. Finally, he settled on December 21st, 2012, because that was one of the larger, one of the endpoints of the larger cycles. It was close. It wasn't exactly December 21st, 2012, but it was close enough that he tweaked it and said, this is the date, partly because we didn't know about the Mayan calendar when we'd done this thing. but and And then, so he predicted that's when the concrescence, the singularity, will manifest. And this became a meme in the culture, and it became tied up with the notions about the Mayan calendar. I had my tinfoil hat on. Hmm? I had my tinfoil hat on. Yeah, well, you weren't alone. Yeah. A lot of people did. By the time 20, December 21st, 2012 came along, I mean, I'd taken off my tinfoil hat. I had a lot of problems with the time wave. Yeah. I did not. I was a major skeptic, and we used to have arguments or spirited discussions about it or whatever. I told him, you know, this theory is, it's not valid, you know, and one reason it's not, a big reason it's not valid is you cannot specify what will, what will disprove it. How did that make you feel as your brother was doing all these discussions and recorded discussions and he was dropping this, these, all these um, possibilities on, on mankind because you guys did shift the paradigm in regards to philosophy and psychedelics. Yeah. How did you feel as um, you were going down your scientific journey to be a scientist and a doctor? How did you feel when he was dropping some of these bombshells? Well, I, I didn't feel that bad about it. I mean, I, I, I disagreed with a, a lot of it, but I didn't see it as my role to, uh, you know, to be out there, um, you know, arguing to, to be his main foil mm-hmm. or anything. I mean, our, our, and I didn't, I wasn't actually so clear that it wasn't true. Yeah. It's just I said, I have doubts, you know. And at that time, during this period, like from from the time after La Chirera, I went back to school and then I started graduate school. So in the 80s and, and early 90s, when Terrence was really out there on the circuit, I was in the background mm-hmm. I was, and I was happy to be in the background. I didn't want to be a public figure. I just wanted to study my science mm-hmm. and, and do that work. And of course, interested in all this stuff, but... I didn't feel like it was my job to, uh, you know, disabuse him of him, his illusions. Or Steal become, a shine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, so, but he did certainly affect the cultural conversation. The other thing, and, and so pertinent to what, I'm, what I wanted to say, he came back with this idea, which he continued to revise and, and elaborate on and change the dates and change, you know, a lot, make continue to make a lot of uh, suppositions about the time wave, mm-hmm. you know, as time goes on. In a sense, you could say, if you wanted to be unkind, you could say 
he never got over the delusion. You know, I mean, he can. I mean, I recovered. He didn't in a certain way. He still believed this, and and he also believed. I think quite sincerely, he believed that the mushrooms were either extraterrestrial themselves or a channel to an extraterrestrial intelligence of some kind. I mean, he really believed that and, and lived his life in that, in that light. That's why he could take these high-dose mushroom trips in the dark because it was like, oh, yeah, you know, I can clock in, you know, I can check in with the teacher mm-hmm. and see, and it was showing him all kinds of things. Who's to say that's not true? But, you know, it's, I mean, I, uh, I can say that, and any biologist can say, I think, who studies it, the mushrooms are not extraterrestrial. They just aren't. You know, they're too integrated into the phylogeny of life on Earth as we know it, mm-hmm. you know. They, I mean, if, you know, and I, I actually have another talk called uh, something like, is, is DMT an extraterrestrial messenger from, a, from an alien civilization? And what would you the think? The answer is no, it's not, <laughs> actually, um, because you have to look at phylogeny. I mean, if you're going to talk about DMT, and all of these indole hallucinogens, you really have to go back to tryptophan because that's where they all come from. Uh-huh. Tryptophan is one of the earliest, one of the oldest amino acids, mm-hmm. and it is in every living thing because it's part of proteins, yes. right? So, I mean, this is another tangent we could go off on, but... We don't have to go there right now. The point is that mushrooms themselves are not extraterrestrial. I mean, the idea that the spores came across the galaxy and drifted. No. I mean, Rode it's romantic. In on a rock. It's a romantic notion, but it ain't true. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Now, mushrooms may open up, you know, psilocybin may have an effect on the nervous system that opens up some kind of, you know, portal to uh, some, you know, if, if you believe the quantum theory of consciousness and all this, all this stuff, it may open up communication to, you know, some kind of non-locality phenomenon where you might actually get information from, from uh, you know, some other source. Uh, and that would be very hard to, to prove. But you, you have to prove it through physics, not biology. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just maybe something about the nature of this molecule, the nature of the way the brain is built and, and, and consciousness is that opens it up. The thing mm-hmm. is, Terence was, I think, utterly convinced that he was, that the mushrooms were an ambassador to the planet and that, and that they were... You know, they had appointed him as pretty much the spokesman mm-hmm. for this. The point I made yesterday in regards to our spirit, wouldn't we have to know exactly what the spirit is to be able to even dictate that? Because right now, all we know is that these psychedelics are a bridge yeah. to something greater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what what I say, I, I don't disagree with Terrence that much. Mm-hmm. I just say... I think these things are messengers, mm-hmm. molecules from some higher intelligence, but it's not extraterrestrial. It is the Earth itself. Mm-hmm. These are not extraterrestrial messengers. These are terrestrial messengers yeah. that have these plants, these fungi, have produced them for far longer than we've been here. Mm-hmm. But as we show up, turns out, they adapt them to be messengers to speak to the monkeys, you know, who have these complex brains. And because they have these complex brains, they're decidedly a problematic species, you know. I mean, humans are the most dangerous thing that's ever shown up in the course of evolutionary time. Also, the most promising thing. And the Gaia, uh, which is a a new-agey woo-woo word 
but I still like it. I, I don't think of Gaia as the New Age people do. I think of it as James Lovelock does, and he's a geophysicist. I think the planetary biosphere is a super organism, mm-hmm. and it is intelligent. It has an intelligence, and it knows what's going on, and it knows that this species, these, these monkeys, are way out of control. And I think that it's using these molecules as essentially a way to, you know, using these plants, which indigenous people call plant teachers, maybe they should be called plant ambassadors. Mm -hmm. It's using them to speak to the monkeys to say, basically, wake up, you clowns. You know, you're wrecking this Mm -hmm. place. And that's the message so many people get when they take mushrooms, when they take ayahuasca. A lot of times it's about re-understanding our relationship with nature and realizing that we have to change it because we're, we're destabilizing all of the homeostatic mechanisms that keep the planet functional. And that's, that's the Gaia idea, basically. Have you ever heard of the... I mean, I mean life itself maintains optimal posi- conditions on the planet to support life. This is not an accident. You know, this happens because life is actively intervening to keep atmospheric gaseous uh, composition in balance, the pH and salinity of the ocean, all of these things. That's Gaia. Have you ever heard of the Georgia Guidestones? Uh, no. There's this prominent banker um, went to this granite company, this stone company in Georgia. He was a prominent banker in New York, and he went there anonymously, and he had them write these commandments on these huge gu- these huge stones, and then they put them put them down in Georgia. And the first rule is, you must maintain humanity of no more than five hundred million people. Uh-huh. And it, it kind of goes to show, though, if we are going to be back uh, at ground zero or a level playing field with Gaia, mm-hmm. that might be our outlet is to minimize the amount of monkeys we have running around here wrecking the ship. Yeah. Yeah, that is uh, that is one conclusion you can draw is that, uh, you know, at that base, there are just too damn many people. It's doomsday thinking, but at the same time... At what point are we going to be realists about it? We've seen so many hurricanes, forest fires out of control. Um, can't really, I don't think human beings are affecting uh, earthquakes by any means, but we're seeing so much uh, negativity with our atmosphere that it's kind of... Well, I, I think we're, I think these these mega storms and, and these mega fires and all that, it's, it's definitely about climate change. I mean, it is not exclusively human caused, but it's human aggravated, it's human accelerated because of what we're doing. And it's very dismaying because the people that make policy that should be looking for answers for this are complete idiots. And they're deniers. And they have, you know, they're just stupid. Mm -hmm. And not only are they stupid, willfully stupid, proud of their stupidity. This is very dismaying, and this this doesn't spell well because just makes it the sooner we wake up and start taking steps to correct some of this within the limits that we can, the better chance we'll have to turn this around. But you're absolutely right. A big central factor is there are too many people. Mm-hmm. So what do you do about that? It means the Chinese were onto something. Billions of people will have to die. Uh huh. Yeah, <laughs> billions of people will have to die. Better call up Elon Musk. Get us out of here, Elon. <laughs> well, or Elon Musk. But again, you've got a huge technological leap that you have to make. A a uh, you know a heavy lift problem like nothing you've ever seen. Yeah. Terence actually discussed a. Uh, you know, a viable idea, and he referred to the Chinese. If every woman only had one child, Mm -hmm. within two generations you could get a global demographic collapse Mm -hmm. that would begin to bring it back to where it needs to be. How do you convince every woman to have only one child or no child? How do you induce that without having a completely... 
authoritarian kind of government, and maybe that's what it takes. I don't know. We should end this interview here because I have a very dark scenario. <laughs> no, I, I think free will. Um, free will is a gift and a curse. Yeah. And it's a gift, but also that same gift has landed some people into the darkness, into the pits, to the point they're drinking Ibogaine or they're drinking ayahuasca. And they're forced to face their demons because free will has bit its own tail. Yeah. And uh, the doomsday scenario, uh, I think we're, uh, it's, it's tough to say, but it, it, it almost seems like mankind just wants its free will to be thrown out the window. And we just will not admit it to the point where we might need an authoritarian to tell us how to live because we can't handle our own life. Well, it, there is that tendency and this is, and now it's getting even worse. Yeah. I mean, religions have always been the bugaboo in this sense, mm -hmm. the being the institutions that say, you know, we have the answers. You just accept it, turn off your mind, follow off, follow us, accept the tenets of the faith and you'll be fine. The earth is going to hell, but you don't care because your reward yeah. is in heaven. There ain't no heaven. I'm sorry. And, and this is a, like a total shell game. But it's a way to keep people afraid and keep people from asking too many questions and, and doing what, uh, you know, a suppressed... This is what authoritarians have always done. And now, I mean, this is why the current, you know, political climate with Trump and everything is so dismaying because I, well, you know... I'm not even sure I want to talk about this in public, but I, I think very bad things are happening. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's not just Trump. I think that Trump is probably basically working for the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> and, you know, and they are, uh, they have a different agenda than, than and it's not about freedom, mm -hmm. you know. And maybe in a, you know, very practical way, you know, they're saying this is this has to happen because there's no other way to save the planet, you know. But I don't think these people care about saving the planet. I think they care about saving their own ass, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what's concerning. You can imagine a, a, a world government that would implement all these authoritarian measures. It won't be you and I that mm -hmm. get to go on the ship. Yep. You know, we'll be herded in the gas chambers yep. or whatever it takes to reduce the population. You had said that you don't believe in, um, say, the afterlife. Do you believe we tap back into source? After death? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have no idea. No I, clue? I think so. Yeah. I, I think so, but I don't think it's... I don't think it's romping around in the fields of Elysium mm -hmm. playing harps or anything like that. It sounds boring in the first place. <laughs> you know, I don't want to spend eternity doing that. But some of the experiences you get from DMT, 5-methoxy DMT, seem to put you back in some sort of, you know, I've, I've called it at some point, I've called it the Oort cloud of souls. Mm -hmm. That's what I get with 5-methoxy DMT. It takes me back to a place where it's like all sentient entities that have ever lived are there, and you're just a drop in the ocean. You're just one of these things, but you sense the whole, you know, the whole extent of it, and you're part of it. Maybe that's what the afterlife is, is like, and maybe there is no afterlife. I mean, uh, you know... Um, I mean, the problem with uh, these religions is, these Abrahamic religions, a big part of the problem is they have poisoned the Western mind mm -hmm. because they have led us to devalue nature. They've said nature is not, you know, it's the afterlife. This world is not for us. Our future is in heaven, whatever that might be. So they've made it okay to despoil nature and mm -hmm. not value it. So I think that's very dangerous because actually we don't know if any of this stuff that they postulate is going to come to pass or not, and probably not. It's so improbable. We do know that we're here and now in nature, and we know that nature's in trouble, and we're in trouble, 
and we could make a difference if we would wise up. And I think the psychedelics are trying to get us to wise up. Mm -hmm. You know, wake up, first wake us up, and then help us wise up. And what that means is I'm not sure, but come up with creative solutions so that we can somehow make this work. It's crazy because a 19-year-old in a college dorm room sometimes has all the answers with some very brilliant minds um, to get plastic out of the ocean. They're just not really being listened to by the masses. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like the masses, the mass doesn't really, they don't care. They're just caught up on consumption. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So like there's this big debate about plastic straws. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're freaking out Mm -hmm. about plastic straws, but what about all those plastic bottles? What about all those Mattel toys that are made out of plastic? Yeah, yeah, all of this stuff. Yes. All of this stuff. Yeah, and somebody thought up... A solution to that, the the fungus that eats the plastic, or something like that. Well, it's not that there aren't solutions out there. There are solutions. But instead, what do we do? We roll back the regulations against carbon dioxide emission. We we uh, you know, we subsidize the oil companies, we open up the wilderness areas to drilling. We do all the opposite things that we should be doing if we're, you know, if if our leaders had any vision at all, you know, they would say the objective is to make fossil fuels obsolete within five years. But their families have utilized fossil fuels. It capitalized on our natural resources to the point it's made them so much money. It's put them in these positions. Yeah. Well, that's true. You know, that's true. But. Uh, are they so tied to their wealth and their positions that they want to doom their planet? Apparently so. You got a frack, baby. You yeah. got a frack. Yeah. I was oh, up in Standing Rock yeah. last year, and it was just a dark sight to see armed men. Yeah, they're guarding their their profit. Right to the point, I think they just pulled back on that uh, last week, mm-hmm. which was which is a breath of fresh air. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, I live, you lived in the St. Croix River Valley. I live in the Mississippi River Valley. Yeah. And to hear about what's going on just at the at the mouth of um, the Mississippi down in New Orleans and the amount of cancer rates skyrocketing because mm-hmm. all the oil refineries right there at the mouth. And then we had the BP oil spill a few years ago. And we're doing this to our to ourselves because yeah. we're, we're born consumers. Yeah. And and you know we're the one percenters. If you've made it down to the jungle and you've partaken in a ceremony, you're in a nutshell the one percenter of hum- humankind when it comes to mental exploration. Right. And how do we... I was talking to Graham Hancock about this. He was so high-ho about getting ayahuasca up to the States. But mm-hmm. it's like, okay, so we get it up there, but... Just because it's on the corner doesn't mean that that faithful Christian is going to go partake because that bread and that wine, that wheat and that grape, yeah, that's the that's the holy power. Yeah, that's right. Well, this is the challenge, but the you know I don't see any other solution than the than getting the one percenters or the people that are in a position to actually make change getting them to these medicines, Mm. giving them the opportunity to take these medicines, hopefully enough of them will get the message and actually go back and start to make changes. That's the only hope I can see. And and it's it's probably a doomed, you know, it's probably a useless hope. I don't see whatever we whatever else we can cling to, you know? Um so and it's interesting how these things are catalytic, you know. Once the change starts, it be, can become exponential. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, what we're seeing now. More and more people are getting those experiences. They're telling their friends. Their friends are doing it. We're in that stage now. The question is, is it happening fast enough? It's like there are all of these positive trends happening and all of these negative trends and which one is going to win out? I don't know. I don't know. What but do you think, Timothy? In terms Le- of what I can do, what yeah. we can do, not much. But I can be a force to 
introduce people to plant medicines and just let them know about it and try to create opportunities for them to take it and hope that they'll get the message. What do you think Timothy Leary did for the culture? Well, I think Timothy Leary, uh, I think he was... uh, He was definitely a catalyst for change, but I think that he had no more idea what to do with LSD than anybody else mm-hmm. did. And LSD was inherently a socially disruptive technology when it came on. I think what Timothy Leary did, or he didn't do it deliberately, but I think, you know, when LSD dropped into, cult- mm-hmm. dropped into culture... No attention was paid to the fact that there was an indigenous and historical, you know, tradition of the use of psychedelics. Mm -hmm. It was like it was disconnected Mm -hmm. from all that. It took us 40 years after psychedelics were banned to rediscover that, to re-begin to reintegrate those traditions into the use of psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening now. Essentially, we're rediscovering these archaic traditions trying as best we can to revive them or emulate them and link it back to that. Timothy Leary didn't know what the hell he was doing. You know, I mean, he he had a messianic personality. Mm-hmm. Uh, LSD was something that came along that was potentially a catalyst for social change, which it was, but it was handled so ineptly that many people got afraid, and especially the government gets afraid. It's just like Terrence said. Psychedelics are dangerous because they give you funny ideas. Mm -hmm. Funny ideas are inherently dangerous. The government knows this. The authorities know this. That's why they had to suppress psychedelics, Mm -hmm. not because the drugs are dangerous, because the ideas are dangerous. Ideas like maybe I don't need to go to Vietnam and kill people I don't know. Why would I want to do that? Mm -hmm. Or maybe I don't need to work in a cubicle all my life so I can work so, you know, they can take away my retirement when I when I retire, you know, rebellious ideas, not part of the, uh, you know, the good, the, the whatever they want you to be, not part of the happy robot consumers that they want everybody to be. Mm-hmm. But I, it's not sustainable. It has got to change. I do not know how that's going to happen. I think, the, I think the 20th, first century is going to be pretty rough. There's going to be some ebbs and flows, and I think we are going to still see the phoenix rise as we uh, as we go through this dark age, I think we're about to be graduating from it. Wasn't that uh, the center point of the dark age? Was December twenty first, twenty twelve? Yeah. And we go up, see, and so like, if we know our planet goes through ages, and that obviously affects mankind, yeah, we're on our way out. It's just it's going to take a little time. It's going to take a little time or a lot of time. I think, <laughs> you know, there's also the possibility of. You know, and and maybe this is maybe this is the something we should hope for. But there's a possibility, more than a small possibility, of some global natural catastrophe that will kill billions of people. Mm-hmm. But that at least it's a natural catastrophe, so we can, you know. And there are numerous things that could do that: plagues, asteroid impacts, super volcanoes. All of these things are on the agenda, you know, and not the trick is to predict when it's going to happen. It could be tomorrow. It could be thousands of years from now. The interesting point that Graham made is how often we go through the Kepler belt. What's that? (laughs) The Kepler belt. Yeah. (laughs) How often we go through it and like the odds of us getting hit, we're pretty much winning the lottery every time we get through it Mm -hmm. Um, in, in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, and knowing the research that him and um, Randall Carlson did is very interesting in regards to that's probably what killed the woolly mammoth and the saber toothed tiger. Yeah, yeah. This is not. This is this is documented yeah. now. I mean, this this younger Dryas impact yeah. is scientific fact. Mm-hmm. This is accepted by geologists and 
planetologists reluctantly, but except the for the Christians, is there. the Christians don't want to hear it. Well, the Christians are deluded. No, of course they don't want to hear it. I don't know why. Aren't, aren't they the ones that want the apocalypse to come? You know, the problem is Jesus ain't coming. You know, the alien space brothers are not going to show up either and save our ass. Only we are going to save our ass. And it's not looking good. Little do they know Jesus is rising every single day <laughs> on the horizon. Well, yes, <laughs> yes, that's right. That's they're right. son of God. But they're, you know, they're estranged from nature. Yeah. They don't value nature. I mean, the whole, the whole, uh, you know, moral stance of, uh, you know, of, of Christian ethics and so on is to deny biology. Yep. I mean, what do they hate most? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Yep. What are the three main characteristics of life, sex, drugs, and rock and roll? <laughs> and I don't mean that speciously. You made a great point regarding uh, microdosing LSD and what it does to our receptors in our brain. It kind of folds over them. Yeah. Can you kind of elaborate on that? Because I do have many listeners who definitely indulge in microdosing. Well, I think microdosing, the concept of microdosing is probably sound, but using LSD for microdosing may have some safety issues. I think psilocybin is much safer to microdose mm -hmm. with because it doesn't interact with the receptors that way. The receptor doesn't fold over it and trap it in there, which it does with LSD because of its unique structure. When that happens, LSD stimulates a lot more than the uh, 2A receptors, which is associated with the psychedelic effect. Mm -hmm. It also stimulates other serotonin receptors, particularly the 2B receptor. And stimulation of the 2B receptor has been associated with a condition called uh, valvulo tissue proliferation, basically. Okay. There is a term <laughs> for it. Where it causes the tissue of the of a particular of the heart valve to proliferate. It's an irreversible process. And only surgery, only a valve replacement can fix that. There were a couple of drugs in the late 90s. You've heard of Fen Fen. Mm -hmm. This was a combination of drugs. They were serotonergic agonists. They also hit the 1B receptor. I forget what the therapeutic action, why they were taken, but there was something that you take daily, right, like microdosing. Mm -hmm. And um, they were taken off the market because of this problem. And, uh, and LSD is safe to take once in a while, as most people take it to have a trip, but I think it's dangerous to take it every day because of this potential hazard. And I can tell you where to read more about this. There's actually a lot about it in, in the literature. Mm -hmm. in, in the, if you go into PubMed and look at 5-HT2B and FENFEN, it's F-E-N hyphen P-H-E-N, it'll all come up. Um, Brian Roth is another guy who's written about this. But the most accessible um, piece of information is on the Hefter website. Mm -hmm. So go to hefter.org and look at the blog. Okay. And there's a little piece in there about this. And the Hefter Institute is yours, correct? Yeah, the Hefter Research <laughs> Institute. It's not mine. I'm a member of okay. it. I was one of the founders of okay. it. But, but many more important people than me as part of it. Oh. Dave Nichols is the, is the president and... We founded it in the early 90s, just a bunch of nerds, basically, uh, who wanted to start a foundation to investigate psychedelics for medical uses. Okay, so we're pushing an hour and a half. Hefter, H-E-F-F-T-E-R, dot org. Yeah, we should probably end this. I got one more question. Okay. And this is the funnest one, all right? Five greatest inventions. This can be something that's already created, or Theo Vaughn created five on the spot. Typically, people go with what's already around. I can already probably guess one of yours. Now, we'll start at five, and we'll get down to the gr your, your greatest invention of all time. This isn't something that you've invented. This is something that has shaped your life. What's that? The... 
We'll start at five. You tell me, doctor. What? I don't understand the question. Okay, so like mine, one of them is um, is the iPhone. Yeah. Dr. Dre, because he brought us so much greatness culturally. Yeah. Um, so what would your five be in regards to uh, what shaped your life um, from an invention standpoint? Well, yeah, I'd have to agree. Uh, despite the, you know, besides all the talk and everything, mm-hmm. yeah, something that had an actual impact on society was figuring out this very simple technology to grow mushrooms, which other people knew how to do. It's mm-hmm. not like we made that discovery. I think what made it different is we provided this this technology that any any nerd in his parents' basement or any you know undergraduate in a dorm room could buy a few mason jars and grow more mushrooms mm-hmm. than they knew what to do with. And that had an Im- impact on society. Mm-hmm. That really did have an impact. And now mushrooms are everywhere. Mm-hmm. So as Terence said once, you know, we're involved in a symbiosis, a symbiotic relationship with something ha- that has disguised itself as an alien invasion in order not to alarm us, <laughs> right? Yep. And that's what the mushrooms are. Okay, Dennis, you got four more. <laughs> Okay. What? What are four more greatest inventions that have oh. shaped your life? What? Uh, shaped my life? Yeah, sure, oh, man. You mean, you mean that I invented? No. Oh, <laughs> greatest inventions. Oh, God. Uh, I don't know. Um, um, that's not a fair question. Damn it, Dennis. <laughs> huh? Dude, you're, you're literally the smartest human being I've ever talked to. No, <laughs> True. Pull that's it not, out of your that, butt, dog. That's not true. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I'd have to say the iPhone had a big impact mm-hmm. on me and everybody. And I must say, uh, uh, to, sorry to cut you off, but watching you try to operate your iPhone might be one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Why is that? Because you keep getting these calls, and it's like you get a million calls, and you still don't know how to put it on silent. <laughs> Well, I do. I do know how to put it on. Oh silent. my gosh! Yeah, you just fumble it, it around. Ah, 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 I don't know what to do. Ah, I know ah. how to put it on silent. <laughs> I, I do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the okay. iPhones. So you- there's that, and uh, uh, you know, mushrooms, the iPhone. Um, Two out of five is bad. I don't. I don't know. What do you meet, love? Two out of three ain't bad. Hmm? <laughs> I said, what do you meet, love? Two out of three ain't bad. Two out of three ain't bad. No, I. I don't know. I'm tired. I can't think of. I know. Three more. I know. We'll let you slide then. Mushrooms in an iPhone. Mushrooms in the iPhone. The yeah. iPhone mushroom. Yeah. Maybe that'll be the name of the episode. Yeah, iPhone yeah. mushroom. I think that, uh, yeah, I think that uh, those have had an impact. Uh, Mushrooms, mostly positive. The iPhone, I think the verdict's out on that. (laughs) You know, whether it's positive or negative, there are different aspects to it. Isn't it crazy to hear about all the minds that take psychedelic adventures that work in Silicon Valley Mm -hmm. and that are creators? I know the um, executive producers and James Cameron, uh, who created Avatar, went down to Blue Morpho, where I go sometimes in Peru, um, prior to making the film. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. They're taking these journeys and then they're coming back to the Western world, creating beautiful pieces of art and technology. Yeah, yeah. And that's important. I mean, I think the Avatar is a significant movie, you know, because of its message Mm -hmm. and and all that. And these people are clearly, uh, you know, psychedelically educated. And Elon Musk and uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin and all these people, I mean, they've all taken mushrooms, I'm sure. Many have taken ayahuasca at the same. And they are making changes. There's just so, there's not enough of them. We need more inspired, visionary technologists, you know. And again, I don't know if it's happening fast enough. On to getting Trump some mushrooms. All right, Dennis. Okay. Appreciate you. All right.